by the industrial technology of the email, the SMS, the blog, the Twitter. I use none of these, but I do notice when I'm sent hard copies of emails, for example, even when they're quoting poetry or citing passages of prose, that they're almost always ungrammatical, misspelled, abbreviated. There has been no revision. Owen and Sassoon were constantly revising their work. All decent authors do this. But speed and brevity have overtaken the precision and discipline of writing. In a world where even the names of our towns can lose their apostrophes, this is happening in Britain today, how can we preserve our contact with the past? True, the distortion of language is not a solely English sin. In the largely immigrant, immigrant suburbs of Paris, as many of you will know, I think, there has come into existence an argo in which words are inverted, spelled backwards, spoken backwards, in an almost conscious, probably conscious, rejection of French culture. Yet this is a code as simple to unscramble as an artillery coordinate on the Western Front, or a directive to a 1940 Battle of Britain pilot to vector on enemy aircraft at Angels 5, 5,000 feet. And yes, I can see how the British soldiers' mistranslation of Wipers for Ypres or Charlie Roy for Charlois might be given an SMS context. But this was surely out of weird affection rather than error. It is the sheer, almost willful failure to manage language rather than to control it, which is what we are allowing our mobile phones and blackberries to do. We all faced school examinations that demanded answers in not more than 400 words. But when told how many characters, how many alphabetical letters we may use in a Twitter, we are losing our freedom of expression. Increasingly, for example, I'm being sent hard copy messages from which most verbs have been deleted. And I'm reminded of a lunch I enjoyed in Dublin, in Ireland, 30 years ago with John Dillon, an opposition but pro-British member of the Irish Parliament, who opposed Ireland's policy of neutrality in the Second World War, but who, long before the Second World War, had supported the Irish equivalent of the Nazi brown shirts, led by a former police officer called Owen O'Duffy. Dillon described to me the moment he realised that O'Duffy, as a fascist, was a dangerous man. One day, in West Cork, I was standing behind him on a balcony when he addressed a rally of several thousand young blue shirts. He was speaking very rapidly, and it dawned on me that they were hanging on his words in a kind of obsessed way, and I suddenly realised that he was speaking without any verbs. It had no discernible meaning, and I remembered Hitler. The German great war veteran Junger, I think, might have approved of this verbless world, for it cuts us off not only from reality, but from our shared past. Ein Reich, ein Volk, ein Führer. How in future will we interpret the glorious, fearful description of Ypres that Blunden wrote after the Great War? Over the sepulchral catacomb city, aeroplanes flew and fought in the cold winter sun. Sentries blew their whistles from broken archways. The brass shell cases used for gas gongs gleamed with a meaning beside them, and all of a sudden, flights of shells came sliding into the town. Those words will have to struggle for their place in a world where libraries of books have been abandoned for what British education authorities call language tools, screens rather than pages, <coughs> surfing rather than deep reading. The other day I was on a flight from Paris to Beirut, four hours and 45 minutes. And next to me was a French woman reading a book about the Second World War. And she was turning the pages like this. <laughs> this is incredible. <laughs> and she finished before she reached Beirut. <laughs> 360 pages. And I realized she had lost the ability to deep read. She was searching the pages of the book. Will we, in another generation, have to translate Blunden and Graves into new computerized language, just as today most of us need translations to understand Chaucer's Middle English and Canterbury Tales? Are the words of the Great War soldiers going to sound like Beowulf in Old English, an epic of war which to understand it does now need interpretation? Those dead battalions of 1418 will have to fight to be heard. Will we let them? Can they remain as imperishable as we would wish? Or is their language to be as tattered as the paper upon which it was once written? Years ago, I found in Belfast a sad memento of the song. This is it. 
the work of the Northern Irish Protestant Worldwoman who fought in the Ulster Division, the 36 Ulster Division, and spent some of his time in the trenches of the Western Front, sticking newspaper clippings into his old railway notebooks, <coughs> patriotic poetry, photographs, cartoons of the Kaiser about to rape the Virgin Belgium. <laughs> his old book is falling to pieces now, as you can see. Its cover flaking off from the damp of those trenches long ago. Its pages as fragile as old bone. But one article this long ago soldier scissored from the papers stands out. It's a report on the execution of nurse Edith Cavell, shot by a German firing squad in Brussels on October 12, 1915, for helping up to 200 Allied soldiers escape from occupied soldiers. The report, the anonymous Bel Belfast soldier left no indication in the newspaper in which it was printed, is remarkable for its lack of emotion and records Cavell's last words as they were reported at the time by the Reverend H.S.T. Garner, the British chaplain in Brussels, probably, I suspect, an Irishman. Here it is under the headline, An Atrocious Crime. We all know the four words chiselled onto her memorial near Trafalgar Square in London. Patriotism is not enough. But these are merely a sound bite that give the impression, the suggestion, that she wanted further battles. <coughs> but here, according to the report, in this old soldier's book from the trenches, is what she really said in contrast. I have no fear nor shrinking. I have seen death so often that it is not strange or fearful to me. I thank God for this ten weeks' quiet. Life has always been hurried and full of difficulty. This time of rest has been a great mercy. <coughs> they have all been very kind to me here. Yeah. But this I would say, standing in view of God and eternity. I realize that patriotism is not enough. I must have no hatred or bitterness towards anyone. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Mm -hmm.